welcome um, everybody uh, to this week's Griffith Asia Institute Asia Research Story. Um, I'm Renee Jeffrey, um, and it's my pleasure to be back um, after the break um, with another great Asia Research uh, Story. It's fabulous to see so many of you joining us today. Um, I hope everybody is keeping safe and well uh, wherever you are um, in the world right now. Uh, so before I introduce this week's guest, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands on which we're meeting, um, watching and participating in this event. Uh, today I'm on the lands of the Jagera and Turrbal people and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, for those joining us live via Zoom for, this, um, for the first time this week, uh, welcome, it's great to see you here. Um, it's really great that so many people um, from different places are able to join us each week. Um, can I please ask everybody um, who's on Zoom to keep their cameras and microphones switched off um, for the duration of the session, um, because that helps us uh, with editing. There will be a short Q&A session um, at the end. Please submit your questions uh, using the chat function. Don't feel like you need to wait until right at the end. Um, it's great to have some questions ready to go when we get to the point um, of having uh, the Q&A. Um, and of course, we'll be over on Twitter later in the day. Um, our hashtag is researching Asia stories. Um, so for those listening to the uh, recording or watching the video later, um, we really hope you enjoy today's conversation. So this week's guest uh, doesn't need much introduction. She is a very well-known superstar of Australian international relations, um, but I'm going to introduce her anyway. Uh, Sarah Davies is a professor in the School of Government and International Relations here at Griffith University. Uh, she completed her PhD at the University of Queensland and has previously worked um, in the School of Justice at QUT. Uh, she was an Australian Research Council Future Fellow um, and is an adjunct at the Gender, Peace and Security Centre at Monash University. Sarah's work has focused in three main areas that are all related to issues around the denial of human rights um, and situations in which populations face serious vulnerabilities. Uh, she primarily works on forced displacement, gender and sexual based violence in conflict and disease outbreaks. Um, and her work brings a feminist approach to understanding when and how international governance engages with the rights-based needs of populations at risk. Uh, Sarah is the author of three single-authored books and a co-authored book. Her most recent book, um, Couldn't Be More Timely, um, Containing Contagion, was published in 2019. Um, and I have to add that she has just um, achieved the incredible feat of getting published in Nature, um, that great academic holy grail. It's an amazing achievement. Um, so welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, I feel like there's someone else actually who you're wanting to talk to after all that <laughs> No, not at all. Um, so look, your work on disease outbreaks is understandably keeping you extraordinarily busy um, at the moment. Um, but before we, got, we get to that, um, I wanted to talk to you about your career and how you go about doing your research. Um, so of all the people that I've talked to in this series so far, you've probably followed the most standard academic um, course um, you had a fairly straightforward academic trajectory from undergraduate to PhD to being, um, to being an academic. So why that choice? Like, why have you pursued academic life over all the other things you could have done? Because your, your work has so much real world engagement. So there are lots of other things you probably could have done. So, so why this? <laughs> Thank you. The answer is actually quite boring. It was just, just a collection of sort of um, events and circumstances and a little bit of serendipity thrown in. My path originally was to work in the National Archives of Australia. Oh. That was my plan. That's where I was going. That's what I was going to do. I had a graduate entry job all lined up mm -hmm. uh, after I'd finished my honours. Um, and I was working full time in a Quite a boring job for a certain uh, public service area in in, Queen, in Brisbane, which will remain unidentified. And um, I was I'd kept studying part time because I was bored, and uh, I was trying to figure out really what to do. I loved history, and that was the area that I really wanted to keep working in. Mm. Uh, and I got this graduate entry job into uh, the National Archives and at the same time I was in deep conversations about doing a PhD at the University of Queensland. And 
I really wasn't sure which path to take actually and so I decided to defer the archives position and start my PhD at, um, at UQ while also just continuing to do a bit of part-time work in the city and it kind of just all took off from there. The other option was I was going to do a PhD with Robert Cribb, an amazing Indonesian scholar really incredible individual who taught me so much uh, he was going to ANU uh, and he had done these amazing archival work on um, you know the 1960s in Indonesia and I was going to have to learn Indonesian and I'm just dreadful at languages I am so bad I am really bad and it's embarrassing my dad speaks multiple languages and he just can't understand why I just I, I can't even say hello in a lot of pain. <laughs> so, so it was that realization that that pathway was closing. It was between archives or continuing with the PhD. And I didn't actually have any intention of becoming an academic after my PhD. None at all. Again, oh. it was just something I, I, I stumbled into. <laughs> Your interest in Asia, did that start as an undergraduate? I mean, you talk about um, Robert Cribb and studying Indonesia. Did you do a lot of Asian studies in your undergraduate degree? Yes, so I did. Um, that was always really interesting to me. I'd originally wanted to do Pacific actually because I'd lived in the Pacific when I was a child and a teenager. And so I really wanted to actually do Pacific uh, work, but I wasn't able to do so at the time. There wasn't a lot on offer. Um, so the Asia, Asia material and the political science and the history was very much sort of popular at the time and there was a lot of subjects to pick in that area for both of those disciplines and so that's how I sort of stumbled into it. Robert Cribb was very influential in the history space and then actually Peter Chalk who was um, who was at UQ at the time was with a number of his excellent PhD students there were some really fantastic PhD students who were doing a lot of the teaching as well and they were really influential in terms of my interest. Also, there was a lot happening in the region at the time. There was so much in the mid, late 1990s, I'm revealing my age now, no surprise. And um, that, that it was a time of just constant change. And that was really interesting to me as a, as a historian, as I saw myself at the time to be observing history. Mm. So then you became um, more a scholar of international relations than history. Sort of what, what prompted that sort of shift from doing, yeah, from doing history to, to very much doing international relations? Uh, there, was a, there was a slight stumble at the beginning of my PhD where I was sort of not quite sure where I was going with my PhD. I had quite a clear path in my head who was going to supervise me. It was going to be on refugees in, in the region. And then there was a little bit of a stumble for a couple of months there work and supervision arrangements, who was going to supervise me. None of that kind of worked according to plan. So yeah. being there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I, thankfully, I had the intervention of Roland Bleicher and Barbara Sullivan. Yeah. Who, you know, the dream team for, for, from my perspective, who very much sort of stepped in and said, you know, what do you want to do? What interests you? And I was like, I'm really more of a sort of a historian than an IR scholar. And they were like, oh, don't worry about that. <laughs> um, we'll take you, we'll supervise you. You just do what you want to do. And I really wanted to look at the history of asylum in the, in the um, Asian region. At the time, I was particularly interested in the Indo-Chinese refugee crisis. I'd grown up with a lot of stories of that period of time being told to me through people who had witnessed it. Uh, and I was really interested in understanding how those experiences were um, were sort of, if you like, responded to at a formal setting. So I wanted to know how states that were doing the pushbacks, what was going on, what was the thinking around there. I also wanted to know the role of the Cold War. And I really wanted to learn more about the role of international organisations that we would normally turn to as kind of being these you know, hard work, but the beacons are trying to promote a, an idea of the right to, to being a refugee. So something that we've talked about a lot um, over the years, um, many, many coffees and lunches, um, is field work. 
Um, it's yep. a perennial topic of conversation, partly because we tend to catch up after one or other of us has been somewhere interesting and we want to hear all about it. Um, yeah. You know, and so we've spent a lot of time talking about the challenges and the delights and the real practicalities of doing research in really difficult places and on really difficult subjects. Um, and we've talked a lot about you know, the importance um, of being out there in the region, sort of rather than sort of commenting from the, you know, the safety and security of our really very privileged lives um, here. So for the research that you do, why do you think um, that being out there and doing field work has become so important? Well, I want to acknowledge I'm not an expert in the in interview methods and I'm not an expert in, in you know, in ethnographic research. I feel it's important just to state that, first of all, that wasn't my, that's not my area of expertise, but yes, it is something that I, I do a lot and I believe in doing it. Uh, I think it's important for a couple of reasons, uh, I think context matters. I think while we very much like and understand in this in this discipline to focus on macro trends and try and understand big sort of causal shifts, I kind of feel like at the end of the day, it's really important to understand in these environments where there are still um, different experiences, different groups who don't always have the same access to information or the same um, position as others to, to try and capture that, to try and capture that. Because I think that in the international relations space, while it's obvious states matter, and we're seeing that right now, mm. we also need to understand as well, and I think this outbreak is showing us that as well, that exclusion of groups and exclusion of different experiences can really harm cooperation. Um, and so for me, it's only in getting into the field, do you understand that? Can you learn from that? And can you um, just have this understanding of how the, the word social is lived and realized in these environments that, like you say, are not mine? The, que the quest for me is always to make sure that it's respectful, it's not extractive, mm -hmm. and it is, of course, ethical. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and right now, like, you know, I'm thinking a lot about poor, you know, I'm thinking a lot about situations where you have to tread with care. I'm thinking also um, about, you know, Dr. Kylie Moore Gilbert and what's going on with her right now in Iran, you know, and the tragedy mm -hmm. that's happened with her, um, you know, with her arrest and imprisonment, you know. So I think also it's always conscious as well, the need to be, um, you know, aware of the, of the, dangerous implications sometimes of this work as well. Yeah, no, that's, that's right. Um, so I guess two things come out of this. And the first is that, you know, by its very nature, your work focuses on vulnerable populations. Um, and, you know, something that you've just hinted at, but something we've also talked about in the past, um, is the ethics of engaging with people who uh, might be at risk or uh, might have experienced significant trauma in their lives. So how, how do you think we can balance as researchers the need to talk directly to populations um, that we research to make sure we are understanding the reality of, of the social world in which they find themselves um, and those ethical considerations, some of them that you've mentioned around exploitation, um, around seeing sort of other people as sort of subjects um, of our research and that sort of potential for re-traumatisation. You know, we're not trained psychologists. Um, the, the risks are very real. So, so how do you approach that sort of balancing act? Yeah, it's a great question. And one of the things that I've always been very clear in my research projects is about who am I engaging with and mm -hmm. why am I engaging with certain populations in relation to the research question that I'm asking. And so for me, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a social worker. I have always made it very clear in my projects that I'm trying to understand how policy and engagement happens rather than trying to understand the access to healthcare or the journey of individuals. So for me, I don't seek ethics applications to talk to um, victims of sexual violence and I don't seek ethics applications to talk to uh, people who are experiencing infectious disease outbreaks. What I seek ethic applications for is to talk to people who are either devising the policy or who are mobilizing the activism around these groups or uh, 
part of the response effort and that might be an NGO or that might be a government or that might be a research institution and for me it's really important to keep those distinctions in place because like you said there is a whole range of risk to those individuals of re-traumatization and then duty of care that then follows that I can't provide now in the research that we've done on sexual violence there is the possibility that we have talked to NGOs who are represented by victims of sexual violence. We don't, or survivors, sorry, survivors of sexual violence, we don't know. Uh, but a lot of our questions in that project, for example, are always around how is reporting conducted? What are the constraints on reporting? What are the um, timeframes? What types of observations do you see around who is coming forward with reporting? We never ask for names, descriptions, we never ask for the, the attacks to be um, retold. Yeah. We, ve we keep it very much, if you like, at that kind of institutional level focus. And then, our f then in terms of us trying to identify groups who may be excluded, that's the attempt there is for us to say, who do you identify in this space whose voice not being heard? Or experience is not being heard and so it's not a direct it is the sort of if you like a medium path if you like we're not going direct to the source but I'm not a journalist either and I think that's also the other thing that's really important in field work I'm not a journalist I have no um, desire to get a scoop I have no desire to catch someone out mm. I'm trying to understand the context I'm trying and, and for me understanding how policy is, is, um, is developed in real time, the effects of policy, the effects of a United Nations mission reporting on sexual violence in a country and what impact that has on that country's practice and understanding of sexual violence. That's what I'm trying to understand. I'm not trying to investigate. I'm not trying to catch people out. I'm trying to understand how that system of awareness and understanding has been set up and what effect it's having. Um, so I suppose that's the way in which I kind of practice it and try and um, make sure that I comply with, with, the, with, with the ethics, but also I think with what, with what I just feel comfortable doing and also because I can't follow up always as well so I think also it's the other thing I can follow up with people in research I can follow up with people in policy I can do that I can give that contact and I can give that collaboration mm. um, and so that's where I feel more comfortable doing my interview and field work yeah a really important set of distinctions there I think yeah really nice to hear that sort of mapped out um, in that way something that you've just touched on though is the fact that we know that you know, anyone who does field work knows that no matter how much time we spend planning things, um, thinking through the ethical considerations of what we're doing, there are always situations that don't go to plan or um, situations we find ourselves in. You know, you say you, you're not sure you know, that you could possibly have spoken um, to survivors um, of sexual violence. You, you just don't know. So for every effort that you make, um, you know, these situations do sometimes get thrown at you. How do you deal when you're out there um, in the field, um, when you find yourself in a situation that you're not comfortable with or that you think might not be in the best interests of yourself or, or the person? And that might be to do with you know, the ethics of who you're talking to, but it might also be that you find yourself in a risky situation. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with that when you're actually there? Um, so there's been two circumstances that still play in my head. The first one was when I was having to interview a very senior official, health official, uh, very, very senior. I'd actually come to interview the field epidemiologist and I'm not going to give the country. <laughs> um, but I had, and that's again, I think the ethics of, of, um, of what, when I need to disclose names and places and when I don't, and that's, that could, there could be a whole other conversation yeah. about that, but in, in this instance, you know, the, um, the field epidemiologist who I'd been speaking to really wanted me to meet their superior because this is the thing too, right? Sometimes you requesting an interview can be a sign of status. It can be a sign of the work is being done and being taken seriously. 
Um, but when I arrived and I'd been told beforehand that the person had 15 minutes to talk to me and, and it was very important to the person who I was interviewing that I went and met this senior person. Uh, but when I got there, the, the, the senior individual was very um, dismissive of me and my work, didn't know why I was there, thought I was a bit of a waste of time, was very concerned that I was going to be critical, um, wasn't particularly pleased with the fact that I um, was a young female travelling on my own. In his eyes, there was all these kinds of really... Um, the, the conversation was not heading in the way I originally thought it was going to head. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was for me in that moment, it was being aware that, um, you know, that sometimes in that, and I got through it and it was fine, but it kind of rocked my confidence, to be honest. I had a whole range of interviews lined up the next day and I spent the night going through my head, trying to work out, had I said the right thing for the person who had introduced me? Had I unintentionally created a situation where that individual then was seen as wasting their time by talking to me? It was all those kinds of unintended consequences that I may have contributed to without meaning to. And I kept in contact with that individual and said, you know, was it all okay? I hope. And they were very apologetic as well. But it was a situation where I think, you know, for me in hindsight, I think, you know, I probably would have said, checked first with that individual, you know, how am I going to, how's this conversation going to take forward? The next one was, was uh, about a situation where there was a lot of um, sensitivity around the topic. So it was also on sexual violence and there was a whole range of topics that was discussed in that meeting and we were told it was off the record. And we had to comply and that they, you know, it was very clear. They said to us, it was, it was insight that really, that we actually had been really needing to know it was, but it, we, but it was, it was anecdotal and it was given in a, in, in a, in a position where they trusted us not to share it. Mm. And so we never have, and we never will, um, you know, and I think it's also just having sometimes, um, you know, just knowing that in those situations, you know, it's it's really important to to be respectful of those situations where people are really they're opening up. They're sometimes opening up in ways that they don't mean to. It's just as the conversation goes on, they get more comfortable. But it's very important in those situations to remember, you know, very simple things: stop note taking, switch off the recorder, show them that you've done that because it really can matter for those individuals, you know, Re delete it, show them your, you know, if you've kept recording accidentally. And those were moments where we had a lot of conversations afterwards about making sure that we had shown to those people who talked to us that we had been respectful of what they'd shared with us. And then us making sure that we had done, taken all the steps to show that they were um, not going to be compromised or affected by what we, you know, to the best of our chances of what they told us. Yeah, that's, I think that's that's really important and really and really interesting to hear about that because many of us, I think, that, that work in similar areas and spend a lot of time talking to people in the field know that when people relax and they and you the, the interview goes on and there are elements of com just ordinary conversation that crop up in it and people do accidentally tell you things that they possibly shouldn't. They tell you things that might put them at risk or things that are just too personal and yes. things that really shouldn't be cropping up in our research. Um, and it, but it's all part of that relationship building and that, you know, particularly if you see people over multiple sort of iterations, you do build relationships with them. You do become friendly sometimes with them. And it's about, you know, how do you deal with that um, in your research? So really interesting to hear about sort of some practical steps um, that people can take in terms of saying, no, no, this, this went over the line and this is how we're going to deal with it. So everybody's very, very clear. Um, so the book um, that you published last year, I think you have a copy of it there uh, to show. So embarrassed. <laughs> um, it couldn't be more timely. Um, what inspired this? Where did the idea for this book come from? Great. So <laughs> I was doing archival research. Uh, I was about to say, you have a crystal ball. <laughs> I thought this would be the thing that catapults my career. 
<laughs> we just I had pass a it round now. <laughs> no offense to academe, but if I had a crystal ball, I would be investing in lottery tickets and not in academe. <laughs> 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 just put it out there. But, okay. um, but the, the so it was it was it was it was SARS. It was severe acute respiratory syndrome. I was traveling through Hong Kong and Singapore at the time because I'd been doing the archival research. And it was just really, you know, it was fascinating to me to see, particularly the Association of Southeast Asian States, the way they, nations, the way they responded to this outbreak. I was doing refugees and asylum seekers. I was looking at very different responses <laughs> to, to what everyone were happy to call, but both non-traditional security problems. So, you know, in the, in the colloquium, in the region, you know, um, refugees and disease, health security disease outbreaks were both non-traditional security problems, but were be getting very, very, very different treatment and different types of cooperation and diplomacy. And I was just trying to figure out why that was the case. And that was really what triggered this research interest in, in health security. It was that simple. <laughs> But it's great. I mean, that's so often how some of the, you know, the great ideas for things happen. It's about just being out there and observing things and thinking, oh, there's, you know, there's an interesting problem there. So how did you go about researching it? What did you, what did you do? <laughs> yeah. Um, I made friends with a lot of excellent researchers in the region. And I've got to give, you know, kudos to Melly Cabarello Anthony at uh, NTS in Singapore, you know, who, who was very generous with her time and there are a number of other researchers as well but particularly Melly, you know Kelly Lee, um, Colin McInnes, there were a number of people who were, and Stefan Albay, there were a number who were trying to, who were starting to do research in this space at the time and it was quite a collective group, there was a real effort to try and build this up as a sub-discipline of a sub-discipline, you know, where we were trying to sort of get this up and running and there was a lot of sharing, actually. Um, Adam Cameron Scott was another person who was doing his PhD in this at the time as well. Um, so there was a lot of sharing contacts. And, and, and so that was, it was really a generous group to be part of, which I'm grateful to. And I think, I hope we still are generous to this day. And then it was a lot of cold calling, you know, it was a lot of, and thankfully, because I'd done that with the refugee project, I was already very familiar. I had done a lot of my interviews back then. I done a lot of my interviews via email because a lot of the people who I need to talk to are either retired or were constant rotation. And a lot of them, for some reason back then, they wanted to do email. They preferred email to phone calls because didn't have this back then. Um, and I didn't have the, I didn't have the income to be able to go and do, because they were all in far long different places. Mm. So I had to just find a way to do it. So thankfully I was very familiar with doing emails and, and, but the, thankfully I got some funding and then I was able to go out into the region and do some interviews. And so a lot of just sending out the most, saturine polite emails to people saying you know I am a nobody who does stuff in this looks at the policy space I know you guys are doing all the technical kind of big policy stuff or the technical response area can I please see what you do attend meetings and that was the other thing the um I have to shout out to the Australian Research Council the generosity of the grant allowed me to self-fund um, my my attendance at a lot of meetings in the region, a lot of meetings. And that was the other thing that was really great about the region. There were actually really, there was a lot of um, acceptance of having a non, you know, an observer, which is what I was called, an unofficial observer sitting in the background, observing and, and taking notes. And then I got a lot of interviews with people from that. Great. Um, Look, we're heading towards running out of time. These things go really, really quickly. So I wanted to just um, put a call out there that if anybody's got any questions to please um, put them in the chat um, section and um, we'll, we'll get to those um, in a moment. But while everybody's thinking um, of some, some good questions, I guess, um, I guess my question is that you did all of that research um, that came out last year and now we found ourselves in this situation we're in this year and how does how do the findings um, of that previous project really inform how you're looking at what's going on now like what's the you know, what's the connection there um, between you know, what you found out about you know the management of SARS and things and what we can be learning about 
about how to manage this new crazy world that we find ourselves in? The glib response is that my book is out of date already. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, more serious, yeah, <laughs> the more serious considered response is that I, um, I do think that there's actually a lot to be concerned about what we've seen from the last six months of the response to COVID. We haven't seen the level of political cooperation at the international level that we may have hoped for. Uh, or that we had seen in other outbreak events, actually. You know, um, I would say that if we look at the West African outbreak of Ebola, hemorrhagic fever, while there was, again, a good three, four month lag there in the international community coming together and getting their act together, um, this is now six months, you know, and, 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 and counting. And, and the Security Council resolution that's come forward, the General Assembly resolution that's come forward, it's, there's not a lot of... Um, concrete action there around cooperation. Um, so what I would argue has been important though in this space, I would argue, I'm going to argue this, but I think it's true, is actually we have seen regional organisations try and figure out how to manage the outbreak and how to try and cooperate in those spaces. Um, and I think that has been really actually significant in this region. You know, upset, uh, ASEAN had their first meeting on 30th of January, you know, and, the, and they've been running along since then. And you can point to individual flaws and individual situations where it's not gone well. But I think there's a lot of comfort that I'm seeing at the moment with regional organisations coming together to try and manage this. Um, the African CDC is another really good example where, you know, you're seeing regional organisations trying to step up in this vacuum and I think we've not always thought about how to support them and how to take them seriously sometimes as well. And I think this is pointing out that actually you need to have multilateral, multilateral means you need to have multiple levels of cooperation going on. And for me, that was my argument in this book, that you, that you need to really pay attention to regional processes. They may not look like what you want them to look like as a donor state, as a particular state that has a, a particular net view of how rule of law and regional organisations should work for using the EU model. But there are other ways of cooperation that are really important that need to be considered because it's about normalising cooperation. Sometimes that social act is really important. We've got a question here um, from Fufu. Um, she said she wanted to know um, your experience of interviewee re um, reactions to taking consent. Um, is it easy or challenging? And she said she asked because these standards are usually not familiar to the context. Yeah, that's a really interesting one, isn't it? When you ask somebody for consent and sometimes the reaction you get can be a really strange one, like why do you want me to sign this or what's all this about? So yeah, how, how would you respond to Fufu's um, question? Yeah, it's fantastic. So I always start off with the consent conversation. I, in fact, have a, a note on my notepad every time I go in of the things I've got to take the, the through with each interview. And we have our little pack. Usually I, um, I've already, if I, they have an email address, I've already sent it to them and said I'm happy to discuss it in person. Uh, I think there's two issues that have sometimes arisen, which is the um, understanding what they are consenting to and what they're not consenting to. Uh, and it usually can take, uh, it can take a little bit of conversation sometimes. Um, I always have, an, in addition to the consent form, I have a one to two page description of what the project is and why are we doing interviews in the first place. Um, and I find that also can create more understanding. The issue has sometimes been around language um, and not always taking into account um, that there can also be issues around interpretation of consent and anonymity and what goes on the record and what doesn't. So a lot of the time, um, I, I usually make sure that the good first part of the interview is actually spent discussing that and making it very clear that it's okay to ask questions if you're not clear about what you are consenting to. And there have sometimes been times where actually the person has said to me, look, I really just want to have a conversation off the record, you know, and could we please just do that? And I've, you know, I've said I still need to have a signature, but there's been times where, you know, it's, it's, 
I need to show that we've had this conversation, but I will consent to absolutely not keeping anything and no notes, no nothing. And so, you know, I, I sit there and I make it visible that I'm not taking notes, I'm not recording, it's a conversation. Um, and that's how, they, that's how they prefer it, which is fine. I hope that answered Pew Pew's question. If it didn't, she can come and ask me in our next supervision meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so one here from um, Jane. Um, I'm interested to hear um, the methodology is described. Um, I like it quite a lot. The question is, um, did you use translators and interpreters when doing the interviews or other aspects of the research? Um, and the PS there, very interesting talk. And uh, now I want to read Sarah's publications. There are lots of them out there to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in the, in the uh, health surveillance program, uh, project uh, there were most of the time and this also points to I think in my research the groups that I'm interviewing you know there's a certain amount of so when I say that I want to access different groups I'm also aware of the fact that sometimes in some of my projects I'm accessing privileged elite groups as well right so in the context of the health surveillance program a lot of the people who I've been interviewing they do speak English and they can write and read English um so we've not i think there was only in uh vietnam and indonesia and laos uh and in cambodia where there was times where there was group sessions and discussions that we had or what we call what i call focus groups interviews and there would be times where one or two individuals there someone else in the group would do the translation for them. So there was that degree of, you know, you're aware that in that environment, it's a, it's a closed environment. There are, you know, you're not necessarily going to get full disclosure. But again, in that project, I wasn't trying to catch people out, you know, I'm, I'm trying to understand the process and then I'm trying to then triangulate how different people describe the process in the same country. So that's one of the things, and that's where I can sometimes find discrepancies or, or patterns that are a little bit different or groups maybe who some people are accessing and some people aren't. Um, in terms of the sexual violence project, we did have a number of interviews where we uh, were relying on translation uh, within the group who we were interviewing. And that was also, we've never yet had to, um, seek a, a translator, hire a translator to accompany us on our interviews. Like I've never done a fixer or anything like that. It's, it's, it's always been, I make it very clear in terms of, you know, I'm English speaking, but you know, we're happy to, um, to, to make times that suit people because that's the other thing as well. And I think this is where the situation is starting to change a bit, we, you know, the, the interviews, I think prior to COVID, the number of people doing research and fieldwork research has been growing with the number of PhD students growing. And I think that there is perhaps more and more awareness now that we need to be careful and attentive to the time that it takes people to talk to us and that we're asking them to do that on top of everything else that they're doing. Um, so I think, you know, and that includes having someone in the room to do the translation, you know, so I think these are things that we perhaps need to maybe think about more, um, and engage with more. And I see that also happening at the moment with surveys, you know, issues around survey, survey translation, COVID, it's like survey heavy. And I'm as guilty of that as everyone else as being part of the survey chain. But I think, again, you know, we're needing to think a bit more in all of this space, how we can do it better. Fantastic. Um, great sort of note. Um, I think probably to, to come to a, a close um, on, I was hoping we would have time to talk about what's next, but um, I think we'll all just have to watch this space and see whether, you know, the, the, the suddenly outdated um, Containing Contagion has a sequel. <laughs> uh, the, the new version, you know, you know in light of um, the world of COVID um, that we now live in. But I'm sure you'll all join me in thanking um, Sarah for a really, really fascinating um, conversation about fieldwork and ethics um, and really fleshing out a whole lot of important issues, um, particularly for those of us that spend a lot of time in the field or that hope to again in the future since we're all sort of housebound um, at the moment. 
Um, so thanks everybody for joining me um, this week. Next week, I'm talking to um, Deanne Jandronagoro on um, artificial intelligence. Um, so a completely different um, sort of story um, and a very, very interesting topic about the role that artificial intelligence um, is playing in the region. So I hope you can all um, join me then. So great to see you all. Thanks. Thank you.